If you have your Bibles, would you, or a, a device, everybody's, you know, using devices, that's okay. Uh, would you go to uh, Isaiah chapter 54 and 55, please? Isaiah. bit out of 54 and a little bit out of 55 and uh, I would like to talk about thirst thirst in the human soul so would you pray with me before I read the word please dear father I thank you for this day Lord we come to you looking to you for our help Lord for because our help comes from you we have nothing in us father to bring to your people we have nothing that's of any value other than you Lord we ask you to come with your word we ask you to come Holy Spirit to anoint your word Lord it's you, you bring weight to your word because your word is powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it divides asunder Lord we pray that you will help us to see you what you're trying to speak to us in these days Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray that you'll open your word to us, Father. We depend on you, Lord, for everything. We ask you, Lord, to take this and multiply this word far more than any human mind can comprehend. Lord, you're able to do that. You're able to do. You're able to plow the ground of our hearts. You're able to open it, Lord, to receive. You're able to make our hearts good ground. So we ask you this morning, Lord, to take our hearts and make it good ground, that we receive your word and it would multiply and create a hundredfold if it could be your will. Lord, we need you. We need you as a people. We need you as a church. We need you as a nation. Father, we confess our need to you. We confess our weakness. We confess our frailties. We confess, Lord, we've strayed so far. But Father, you're your arm is not too short, nor is it too weak to bring us back to the place you would have us to be. So we ask you to grant it, Father, according to your mercy today. In Jesus' name, amen. In, in the book of Isaiah, before I uh, read the scripture, I want to share with you recently I heard of a Pastor Tim Delina, who pastors the church in Louisiana now, but he also he used to pastor Inner City Church in Chicago. But he said recently, uh, after the service, a, a young man came up to him uh, and said, uh, "Pastor, I this is the first time I've been to church, and I want you to know that uh, I believe that there's a God today." He said, but "Because I'm an atheist, but today I believe there's a God." And Pastor Tim uh, said he looked at this man and said, young man, he said, how old are you? He said, I'm 12 years old. And he said, uh, and, and Pastor said, all I did that particular day, he said, was I shared a story of the Lord, a, a testimony of what God had done. I don't know exactly which story he shared. Uh, because they, there's a, their church in Chicago was a, a miraculous, it's a long story to say, but it was miraculously preserved by, uh, uh, it was a triple X movie theater. And they wanted to, they prayed that God would somehow allow their church to be there. And beside it uh, was an eight story uh, hotel. It was a crack hotel. And one night, I guess the drug dealers, uh, they hadn't paid their bill, so they made Molotov cocktails and, and, and threw it and, and caught the building on fire. Burned it to the great story. It burnt, burnt the whole block. And this pastor has this picture on his wall. He's telling this story. And he said that uh, as they moved to the, their church, 
a young, a young girl who was a prostitute. He said, this is a modern day Rahab. She stood in front of the building and said, this is my church. You, you can't throw those spot. They left. It burnt a block to the ground. The next morning, the pastor goes in. The insurance set, gives them a check for $7,000 for smoke damage. He said, we go in the building, there's not a smell of smoke anywhere. He said, the greatest miracle was we sent the check back to the insurance company and said, God took care of us, Daniel chapter 3. <laughs> and he said, and that was one of the stories, and it, perhaps that story, this young man heard the power of God. And one story was able to take this young man from atheism to faith. Now, he asked him a question. He said, what turned you to, athe to be become an atheist? He said, well, between my teachers and watching YouTube videos, I came to the conclusion that there is no God. And the pastor was deeply shaken because he had a 12-year-old daughter of his own. And it, it caused me to think the thirst in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl. And to fill that thirst with different things. And what God intends for us to do. That, you know, God, in my, in my heart, I believe that God, Pastor Chris has said it before, has put a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man, woman, boy, or girl. He's also created a thirst, a thirst in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl. And you know, that thirst doesn't go away when you're saved. Do you know that? It should intensify. It should increase. So, uh, going into revival time, shortly, I pray that God will will satisfy the thirst of everyone. All right, let's look at the Word of God and uh, in chapter 54 it says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that's not to travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now, I, I do know that, theologically speaking, uh, this is uh, a speaking of Jews and Gentiles, and that God will come to the Gentiles and increase the Gentiles. But I want to look at it from, the, from the, the, the aspect or from the angle of an individual believer. An individual man or woman who feels like their life is barren, who feels like they have not produced the fruit that they should. And it's very possible that, uh, especially in the life of believers, we oftentimes get to that place where there's a deep thirst to actually do the things of God and to bear fruit for Him, to bring gl glory and honor to His name, but we find in ourselves the inability to do so. We, we sense in ourselves the weakness to be able to carry out that which we would love to do for God, the work that we carry on for Him. And the Lord says that, uh, well, let me go a little farther. Uh, I'm going to go to verse 4. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. And shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. And the reason for it is, your maker, thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Now listen, listen. It, when, when the Lord deals with his people, oftentimes the Lord will, if you would have it, he withdraws, sometimes he withdraws himself a little 
in order to stir us to greater things. He, you know, there. Are, now tell me if this isn't true. You, you have moments in your Christian walk where things are great. You have great emotion. You have stirrings of the heart. You, you, you maybe have made, uh, uh, you've made progress in in some areas of your life that were were bad and things you've laid aside a few things, but then 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 there comes a, a moment where uh, it seems like to the to the senses that you've been forsaken. And the Lord in His love, He's really not. He's just for a moment has withdrawn things in order to stir you up. It's like the in the, in the book of the Song of Solomon. I looked for my beloved. I couldn't find Him. You remember, you remember reading that? I put my hand on the door. I, I went out and I searched. Where, where is He? Where, where are you? And the Lord does that in this. He does it, I believe, in His church as well. He, he creates that thirst for more. You know, you've you got to train. You know, God, in His mercy, He, he, he never stops training us. He never stop, stops teaching us. He never stops. He never stops uh, letting us learn more of Him, more of His ways. You know, the Scripture says that, we've said it before, that the children of Israel knew His acts. But Moses knew His ways. It's a deeper, it's a deeper thing. You know, his, the, the, you begin to learn the ways of God in His dealings. And you don't panic every time. You don't panic every time that there's a, something that doesn't go wrong. You realize that he's, he's, he may have seemed like forsaken you for a moment. But with great mercies will I gather thee. We were watching a ball game for, uh, yesterday with uh, John Mark. They played for the championship. They were undefeated. They whooped everybody every game. And this game got a little bit out of hand. And one of their players, Drew, he's a fireball. I like him. He's, he's always, he's scrappy. And, but the other team was getting pretty dirty. And the referees were letting it get. And as Drew went over, uh, and the boy got, they tied up on the jump ball. This boy threw an elbow. And Drew, boy, you could see it. He lost it. Well, the, the coach ran over and grabbed him up and just turned. Took him off. And it was mercy. <laughs> Because he knew his player was about to be thrown out of the game. There was no way about it. And I thought, what a smart coach. He grabbed his player. In great mercies, he turned him and just, sh just held him. Just held him right there. Gathered him up in his arms. And I thought, what a smart coach. He stopped it and all just settled right down. And he was, you could see tears. He was angry. But after a little bit, he settled him down. And I thought, in the Lord, he will gather us immediately when he sees that we need it. He doesn't forsake us, but just for, in a little wrath I hid my, verse 8, my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindnesses will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. There was a time in my life, uh, I, I don't, I'm sorry to share personal things, but I want to do this where I felt like I was, I'd never been so close to the Lord. I felt like it. I, we were, I was working General Motors on night shift then, and I was pray. I would pray on the way home. And, and I mean, I just weep. I'd have these moments with the Lord where I would just pray, and I was, I felt like I was bulletproof. I'm just telling you the truth. I surely had to be a spiritual giant in the eyes of the Lord. You know, because how could he bless me so much? I just had to be. And I'll never forget one night I was in the spray booth. And I had the worst feeling that he'd abandoned. It just, it was a feeling I've never had in my life. An experience I, I just, I, and, I, and I remember going through a dark night of just, where are you? Where are you, Lord? Where, where did you go? And, but can I tell you, I learned more through that valley than I ever learned on those days of driving home singing and, and weeping and praising Him. It was the dark, it was the valley that I learned the most, that I learned His ways. 
you know, I could tell you his acts before then, but it wasn't until the dark nights that I learned his ways. And so, the Lord is saying, He said, for, this is as the waters of Noah. In other words, the Lord is describing this act that He does, this little bit of a forsaking, a little bit of hiding His face. He said, this is just like the waters of Noah. Did y'all see that rainbow this week? Anybody see it? Oh my, my goodness. It was one of the prettiest ones I'd ever seen. I was up at Livonia. And I went into McDonald's and the lady said, the Lord has given us a great picture, hadn't he? And I said, my, it was humongous. Beautiful colors and everybody's taking pictures. And the Lord says, it's like the waters of Noah. Just like I swore that they'll never happen again. That I will not be wroth with you. I won't rebuke you. I won't. I'll gather you with mercies. Do you know that the anger of the Lord has turned away from you? Do you know that? If you belong to Him, if you're a Christian, if you're born again, His anger is turned away from you. Don't let the enemy tell you that He's angry with you. Because oftentimes, that's one of His tactics. He, he says, well, you know, you're so bad. If, if, if Auburn First Baptist knew who you was, He'd kick you out. And see, you, you, you get this feeling that you're you're failing, you're failing. And the Lord says, I'm not, I'm not rebuking you. I'm not wroth with you. To be, to be totally honest, he laid his wrath on his son. Truly. Truly. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. O oh, thou afflicted. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you were tossed with a tempest and not comforted? I have. But that's who he says, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to lay your stones with fair colors and your foundations with sapphires. I never understood that. I've done a lot of foundations in my life, but I've never made the foundation look pretty. It's something that gets hidden. But the Lord says, no. No, I'm going to lay your foundations with fair colors and stones. I'll make your windows of agates and the uh, gates of carbuncles and the borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the, tea, the, the peace of your children. Now, I want to... Uh, let me go on down. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. For thou shalt not fear and from terror, for it shall not come nigh thee. Listen to me. You have got to know in the days that are ahead, when fear comes, it's not from God. When fear strikes the heart, you know, the scripture tells us in, in 1 John that fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If fear has gripped your heart, if fear of the future and fear of the things and the scripture tells us that men's heart will fail them for fear of things that are coming on the earth. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming, I'm telling you. And every believer is not exempt to be tempted to fear. And that's when you must lay hold on the truths and the promises of God. It's not Him. He says, Behold, they shall gather, surely gather together, verse 15, but not by me. Who, whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Now notice what he says. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I, and I have created the waster to destroy. There's a television program. I don't watch much television, but there's a program that my grandson and I watched one night. It's, I think it's called Forged in Fire. Anybody ever see it? See? Well, they make these weapons. They, the, the smith, or the blacksmith, they forge these weapons in this fire, and they have so much time, if I'm right, they have so much time to make them, and then they're tested by this so-called expert, I guess, who tests them to see if they'll work properly. 
against a, a person or a thing or whatever. And so the Lord is describing, I created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire that makes this instrument for his work. I created it. But notice what he says in verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. So it's a, it's a, it's a promise to the, the child of God that when the enemy comes in with the, with the weapons, that weapon will not prosper. You see. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. What does that mean? Condemning thoughts. Condemning voices. Have you ever had them? Voices that come. They come in, inside the, in the mind. They come with, in, in, condemn and bring condemn, condemnation. Uh, you're no good. You'll never make it. You'll never be this. You'll never stop. You'll never be able to stop this habit. You'll always go back. All of these things. You've struggled with this all your life. You might as well give up. They're condemning voices that come. And the Lord is saying, these voices will not, you will condemn them that, that rise in thee in judgment. Do you remember when the Bible said, one of the prophets, Brother Chris, you might remember, if it was Zechariah, where he said, I saw Joshua the high priest. He was in filthy garments. You remember? And he said, I saw Satan at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord took the, said, take the filthy garments off of him. And what it's a type of taking the guilt and the shame away. And the condemnation. The voices. The Lord silenced the voices immediately. No, put a robe on him. Clean him up. Just like the prodigal son. Give him the ring. Put shoes on his feet. No more condemning voices. No voice that will prosper. You will condemn it. How do you condemn it? How do you condemn a voice? Especially when it's the truth. That's right. You got to combat lies with the truth. Always. Satan can do nothing but lie. That's what he is. He's a liar from the beginning. When the condemning voices come and you say, well, it's the truth. But you must choose to believe God's voice over the condemning voice. You must. You must. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me. What you say, well, you shouldn't even talk to the devil. Really. You might could say, get thee behind me. But you could say, I am the Lord's. I belong to, I am evil. I'm wrong, but he's not. And I'm in him. He's my advocate. He's my redeemer. I'm washed in the blood. I have, I don't feel like I have robes of righteousness, but in his sight I do. I'm clean. I could picture the prodigal son saying, you know, at least I'll just eat outside. You know, I, do, do I have the right to come in here just like I, you know, you, you know that's where the human heart is. Well, I, I can accept a little forgiveness. I can accept maybe a home in heaven. But I can't accept the fact that I'm totally accepted in the eyes of God now. But you are. Okay. There's a cry in the heart of God. Jesus, when he went to, well, I want, let me read 55.1. It goes right, the next verse says, Oh, I don't remember reading that anywhere else. Do y'all? It's got to be important. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy, eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Jesus told the woman at the well, remember? He said, if you knew it was who was speaking to you, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. 
and he you know he the, you know the Holy Spirit he, he lovingly exposes us in order to cover us you see so he exposed her and then uh, in his grace and his mercy he doesn't the condemning voices are gone I mean, well, Jesus said that in, to the woman who's caught in the very act of adultery. Neither do I condemn thee. Right? Woman, where are your accusers? Where are the condemning voices? She said, no man, Lord. You, then Jesus is saying, there's no condemning voice from me. And so Jesus said, they're thirsty. Those that are thirsty, you don't have any... See, there's no ability to buy this anywhere else. Because he says in verse 2, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? In other words, the word spend means to weigh out as you would weigh out coins or weigh out a payment. In other words, why are you uh, giving of your resources for things that don't, hey, don't, there's no value to it. It doesn't satisfy. Just like the, the young man who uh, was watching YouTube videos, you see, taking the resources of that God had given him and spending it on things there was no satisfaction. They're only uh, bringing down, down, down. You see, and we often do that. We 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 will we will take the resources that God has given us and waste them on a temporary, a temporary enjoyment, possibly. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't satisfy. You know what? Hearken diligently unto me. Eat that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me. And your soul shall live. You know I heard a statistic that the average father spends... 4.5 minutes a week in conversation with his ch children. Can you believe that? That's 3.7 seconds a day. And where I heard uh, the man that was telling this, you know, he was saying, like example, go, go clean your room. Go to, do, do your homework. Take out the trash. Little snippets. And he was using it to say, how are we going to communicate truths to uh, the next generation like that? How are we going to communicate this? You see? Even if we don't even take time ourselves to learn it, how are we going to communicate it? If, if, if we, we have the option. You have the option. I have the option. We can waste our time. We can waste our minutes, our hours. We, we, we have that option. You can take the resources that God has given you, but He says, why? Why? Incline your ear to Me. Hearken diligently unto Me. Eat that which is good. Let your soul delight itself in fatness or fullness, abundance, is what it means. Incline your ear. Do you see how much it talks about hearing and listening? Listening, hearing, knowing, thinking. You know, I was telling, in John chapter 7, when Jesus goes to the temple, there were, there were uh, three meetings a year that a Jew would go to the Jerusalem. And one of those meetings was the Feast of the Tabernacles. And Jesus was at the Feast of the Tabernacles. You remember his, his family said, go up. He, he wouldn't go right away. He goes up to this Feast of the Tabernacles. And I looked it up. It's called the Feast of Booths. And that's when the children of Israel would live in booths for seven days on the, on the top of their structures. And they would. it was a type of uh, the, uh, temporary shelters that they were to learn they were always moving and God would tabernacle amongst them 
and that everything's temporary. Even the leaves would fade on the booths and, and it would show the, the brevity of life and, and nothing is permanent here. And God's people are, 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 this is not our home, you see. And Jesus is, He is the tabernacle of God with men, Himself. He goes to this feast. And, and, and they, they tell me at the beginning of each time of that feast, they would go to the Pool of Siloam, which is really... Uh, pure water, clear crystal, and they would, the priest would take it and pour it out as a libation on the altar, and they had this this elaborate, all of these things going on. And Jesus, he, he's witnessing all of this movement and, and, and doing things, doing things. And it's in the midst of this, he cries and says, if any man thirsts, that water poured on the altar is doing you no good. These booths are doing you no good, absolutely no good. If you miss the one, you see, you can miss so much with activity in the wrong place. In the wrong place. God help us. I'm not condemning anything. If you like to surf the internet, surf it. But back off a little. Realize that what am I doing? Am I doing this for 30 minutes and praying for three? Then it's out of balance. Is it not? Something's out of whack. You got to... You, 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 we, we have to face it. You and I have to face these things. It's not, I'm not being a legalist. I'm not saying you've got to do 30 minutes here, 10... I'm not saying that not one bit. But I'm just saying, you tell me what satisfies you then. In the end, which, which brings you satisfaction and fulfillment in your heart? And Jesus says, Come unto me, living water. I will give you living It would be a well springing up into everlasting life. Now he says this again. Uh, Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. This is, this is verse 3. Now, what are the sure mercies of David? Well, look at his life. I took you from the sheep coat. I made you ruler over my people Israel. God taught David as a child, as a youth, how to fight and that his nearness was near him. He said, I'll never leave you. He taught this young man... And even it goes on to living in eternity. That's the sure mercies of David. You will never die. In Christ, you'll never die. When you start looking at the sure mercies of David, it goes all the way through Christ. And that's what the promise is. If you'll incline your ear to me, you will find out what's available to you. Listen to me. Hearken unto me. Bend your ear. Listen. You know, we live in a society that we bend our ears to a lot of things, don't we? We've got more talking heads on TV, radio, my, my, my. You, can, if you, want it, you can't even pump gas and there's a thing. And it's just information all the time. It's just information. And you're just bombarded with it. And, and, and things that we don't even, shouldn't even have to think about. And the Lord says, if you would incline your ear and come to me and hear, your soul will live. It's food for the soul. The outward man perish, but the inward man renewed day by day. Right? This outward man's going to go. Like we said in Sunday school, you know you're getting old when you know your pharmacist by his first name. You, the guy said, your knees buckle and your belt doesn't. <laughs> and you stretch in the morning and you groan because it hurts. And so, our outward man is perishing. But you know, our inward man can be renewed day by day. I'm going to close. Uh, what are you thirsting for? You may be here today and you've never ever given your life to Christ. There's an inward thirst in you that you cannot 
fulfill. You cannot. You can pour everything in your life you want and it'll never, it's like a bottomless pit. And for the Christian, Jesus this is the same call. You know what? It's still the same call. Come to the waters. Come. Well, what did He say to the church in Laodicea? The church, mind you. You say that you're full. You say that you're rich and have need of nothing. But I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Didn't He say that? He's talking to the church here. Come, come, buy without money. And years, many, many years ago, a man named John G. Payton, P-A-T-O-N, he wanted to be a, a missionary. His father was a praying man. It was really incredible to read about his father. He, he, he looked up so much to his father. His father had a, a business. And... John G. would work at his business, uh, father's business 12, 14 hours a day. But he felt a call in his heart to missions. And his father just taught them the, 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 the value of prayer. And his father wanted to be a preacher. But he realized that his calling was to, to pray and nurture those who he had been given. And so he devoted all his time into his family and everyone he was around. And it and this John G. Payton wanted to go off and, and to Papua New Guinea to be a uh, missionary, but there were cannibals there at that time. And it was strange that one of the leaders of the, of the association, I guess, said, you know, they're going to eat you. Because two missionaries said prior had been eaten. He said, well, the skin worms are going to eat your body when you die. He said, so the cannibals eat me. Nonetheless, we'll both be eaten. It doesn't matter. So he goes on. You look it up. Look up, it, look up the story. And uh, this is, uh, they didn't like him. The cannibals didn't like him. One night they surrounded his, his house with a uh, hundred of them, with torches. And they said, we're going to kill you. And they got in the floor and they prayed and said, Lord, you brought us here. And uh, they heard these cries and shouts and but they never came. A few weeks later, one of the chiefs got born again. And he asked him, why? Why didn't you come? He said, how could we? You had, there were big, huge men with white robes and swords. And they never left. That's what tickled me. They never left. We waited. He never left. And I was thinking, because one man inclined his ear to God and listened and knew, and you see, the, there are so many stories. I got, so, I got a bunch of them. Man. I hope you do. I hope your life is being building a history with God. And I hope in these days to come, prior to this revival, even beginning tonight, that you will incline your ear to Him. My goodness, take time. How are you going to know? How are you going to know what to even tell your children, your grandchildren, if you don't know it yourself? Are you going to try to find a promise right quick? There's nothing wrong with that. But start beginning now to learn them. Learn what the Scripture says. Learn what God says about you. How He feels about you. How are you going to combat the enemy? How are you going to combat <clears throat> those weapons that are, that are going to come, those voices, the condemning voices that come, that are formed against you? As we uh, Let's sing. And if there's a burden on your heart, Come. Maybe you are thirsty. Don't be ashamed to be thirsty if you're a Christian. There's nothing to be ashamed about. My word, you ought to be thirsty all the time. For a little bit more and more and more. To know Him more. I am thirsty. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've asked the Lord to even make me that way. God forbid that I settle for a mud hole when there's a spring of everlasting water.